All right guys, I'm going to tell y'all a story that happened about two years ago, since I'm stupid and don't know how to green text and I'm on mobile, it will take a little while to upload it all. It happened at my grandma's house, in a small mountain town in New Mexico, it's so high up in the mountains you can stand in clouds, back to the story, we were up there for my grandma's funeral because our aunt got the house and we got money, anyways, I was outside on the back porch, it was huge because we were on the side of a mountain, it went all around the whole house except one side, there had always been this house slash barn thing at the bottom of the hill, it had a huge gas canister and when you walked past it, it would smell, bad. It constantly have flies, raccoons, squirrels, bears, ect. Also it was pine trees fucking everywhere. So anyways, we had a .22 and were just taking pot shots at anything that moved, we also had a trailer that sat there for as long as I could remember right off the back porch. It had been abandoned for as long as I can remember, although my brothers and cousins told me they used to stay in it, anyways it had been abandoned and I was 16 at the time. My cousin dared me to shoot it, since I don't back down from a dare, I shot at one of the wheels, it fucking exploded. And it tipped and rolled down the hill at that barn thing, it hit it and the gas canister, all we heard was a loud ass crash. The next thing I see will probably stay in my mind forever. Three butt ass naked men run out. Anyways, these three naked ass guys run out, one of them was so fat and fucking hairy he could pass as a gay Bigfoot. And run towards the house and go under the porch, our parents run out and are all freaking out and shit, since part of my family is major redneck, they have rifles, shotguns, ECT. Anyways, we all decide to shoot these weird fuckers, two of my cousins go on one side, one of my brothers stays on the porch with our uncle's handgun, and me and my brother are on the other side of the house, they are armed with their hunting rifles while my bro has a hunting shotgun, while I'm armed with my grandma's old ass double barrel shotgun, have I ever mentioned I have never shot a shotgun before? Anyways, I'm leading in front of my brother, despite him being 21 and me being 16 we all go around at the same time trying not to shoot each other, I come around first and the skinniest fucker runs at me with a knife, I didn't know what I was doing so I squeezed both triggers at once, it blew my ass to the ground, and ripped the gun out of my front arm so I'm just holding it with hand on the trigger, want to know what else got blown? A huge fucking hole inside of that guy's chest, he flies the fuck back and rolls down the hill a bit and stops, in the meanwhile, I'm fumbling about Thai IG to reload because another one of the fuckers is running at me, since I'm on the ground, he grabbed a nail board from under the porch and swings it at me, I pull up my arm just in time, it fucking sticks into my arm and he tries to book it past me, he swung it like a golf club, it's fucking deep in my arm too, I try to pull it out and it's the most excruciating pain I've ever felt, even worse than the time I broke both growth plates in my knees in high school football, I finally managed to get it out, in the meanwhile, my cousins rush over, my brother turns and fires a buckshot into the guy's legs, he drops and tries to start crawling away. I manage to get up with help. With the help of my older cousins I get up, we are looking over the guy that my brother shot, he's still alive and has this look of pure terror on his face he was saying some bullshit along the lines of please don't go down there, please, please, please and he wouldn't shut the fuck up, then we hear yelling, it was Shrek. Just kidding, it was the fat guy who was shaped like Shrek though, he lowered his shoulder and plows through all of us, I can take a hit, but this fucker was fucking strong, I'm on the ground and look up he's just yelling and running straight back into the woods, I hear an ear deafening shot, my cousin shot him in the back with a .308 round from his hunting rifle, he drops and is wiggling around on the ground, by this time everyone is outside while this shit is happening, which includes, kids. Under the age of 10. My bro runs down with his handgun, he's a personal trainer and still is so he's pretty big, he runs over and has the big guy on gunpoint while one of my cousins runs over to help him. I get up and dust myself off, while still bleeding, I just kinda hold the wound and walk up to the guy I shot, it will never leave my mind, 
his chest was literally exploded. Anyways, I call one of my cousins over, load up my shotgun and walk back down to the barn, he tries to stop me and I just tell him to follow, we walk down together while my aunt calls the ranger or sheriff or whatever he was, it was a mountain town. We walk up to this barn and inside is the most foul smelling, reeking mounds of something we have ever seen, you thought the guy I shot was bad. Nine dead bodies, four were skeletons, three were rotting slash half eaten, two were recent kills. I fucking puked. One of them was a kid younger than me. He had gone missing a few weeks before we got there. I remember because my aunt was telling my younger cousins not to run off cause the kid probably had gotten eaten by a mountain lion, my cousin just kinda turned away with an angry look. My cousin was fucking pissed, he had kids and they were younger and he walks back up the mountain to the two guys, they had managed to drag the fat guy back to his skinny friend. He kinda looked like a scrapper from the Fallout 3 point lookout DLC, my cousin was fucking furious, he pointed his gun at the skinny one's face and we had to fucking hold him back, he had kids, we all understood but Jesus fucking Christ. They were going to cannibalize that kid back there. I was feeling like shit so I just walked up to the porch holding my arm and kinda just sat down, the ambulance can't get up the rocky ass road up to the house so my uncle drove me to the hospital, the whole time I just stayed silent, he would ask questions and I would just sit there and stay quiet. I couldn't get the image of the bodies out of my mind. We got to the hospital and they treated the wound, I had to get a tetanus shot, ECT. The cop was lazy as fuck and just waited for me to come back so he took the guys to his squad car and called in the forensic guys or whatever to get the bodies, the ones in the barn and the guy I shot. I got back around two hours later and I just kinda walked in and I was like the elephant in the room. Everyone stared at me. I usually walk around with a dead expression on my face to make people feel uncomfortable, but this time it was legit. My mom told me the cop was on the back porch so I walked out and we did the whole what happened. What did you see? What did you do? Bullshit. I told him everything that happened even with my brothers and cousins there. I just kinda sat there for a while and just stared as the guys took the bodies away, the coup took me to the side of the house where nobody could hear us, he told me something along the lines of those guys were literally insane, they were eating those people. They were cannibals, you did the right thing kid. And he just kinda walked off. And the cops and shit fucked off. When we walked back inside I just kinda sat there looking at my feet. My uncle, which is really redneck, despite him living in El Paso, Texas which is practically Beamer Town, balls up and asks me, well what did the cop ask and say? I told him the stuff and the people's faces in the room were mixes of disgust and depression. I just kinda started crying, I know it was a pussy thing to do, I wasn't wailing or shit, just tears. I just started at the ground and just sat there like that while people watched. I kinda wiped my face and looked up and just stared out the window. I just let the words come out of my mouth and said, if you have any questions just ask me, it'll be easier to put them out now so you don't have to ask later. I only got a few questions, like, what happened? Are you alright? Are you okay? The one that fucked me up the most was my small cousin. Dylan, he was 8 asking me. What was in the barn? It just kind of fucked me up a little, I turned to my cousin, who went down there with me if I should tell him. He said fuck it. So I told them 9 dead bodies I told them the shit about some of them being half eaten and some were spooky skeletons. Then I said the one that fucked me up the most was the kid that got abducted a few weeks ago, it was him. Everyone just stared at me. What fucked me up the most was the next day, more cops showed up, I walked down with them to the barn and we walked into the basement. They restored power for a short amount of time so a single light bulb lit up the room. There was writing everywhere every single inch was covered in random words and some Latin bullshit. We walked back out and I felt as if I had a heavy weight lifted off my shoulders, want to know why. I gave closure to all the families whose family members had gone missing. They might not want to hear they got eaten or were going to, 
but I took what that cop said to heart. Next few days the cops would come every now and then to check up. I stayed for questions for the next few weeks and eventually took a plane back, but in those few weeks me and my cousin covered the barn, from basement to attic, in gasoline and burned it down. Over the days everyone got used to, what used to be a cute boy with a baby face, is now a killer with a baby face, like seriously, it takes me months to grow inch long hairs on my face, it wasn't released in the news because it would fuck up the town's reputation. A few months after I leave the cop that I talked to, his partner got shot and killed by some crazy guy, literally at the house at the entrance to go to the house on the hill. Sometimes I break down and cry when I remember. The one thing G that fucked me up the most is, I have sleep paralysis, I woke up and couldn't move, I have to constantly listen to things for me to not have it, I listen to music slash live streams now, I was in the paralysis and was sitting there and I saw the kid. He was sitting on the end of my bed. He turns to me and says one word. Thanks and he was gone. I woke up just sitting there. I didn't know what to do. I used to go to a psychiatrist and I told him about the thing, he told me spirits can contact through sleep. It was good he did. I did right that day, and now people will be happy that I did do good, other families and even mine, I'm happy now. Finn. I'll take questions now. Go fishing with friend from New Zealand. Fist time night fishing with a boat at like a big lake. We both are excited to possibly catch a huge catfish. Bring weed, liquor to pass the time. At around nightfall we get to a suitably deep bluff and tie our boat off. Catch nothing. In the middle of catching nothing and complaining about it we both start telling each other all of the spooky spooky shit that has happened to us before. Mostly basic shit, I've seen weird lights in the woods and sky before, he saw a giant eel in a lake high in the mountains of New Zealand. It starts getting late and we get more and more intoxicated. He kinda quiets up now says he's gonna tell me something weird and that I should forget it later. But fools don't be so methigay. Tells me when he lived in Australia for four years he was in a bad way. Doing hard drugs, being around the wrong people, getting arrested. ECT. Hits rock bottom and has a breakdown. Decided to sober up by going to a place in the middle of nowhere somewhere in northern Australia. Said he was tired of everything at that point and just wanted to start anew. Drives out into the bush then into true desert, parks his car on a hill overlooking the desert near a few lone trees and shrubs said some mountains were off in the distance. Asides from that nothing, only an empty expanse of sand as far as can be seen. He decided it was far enough away made camp and a fire. While gathering what little sticks he could it dawned on him how desolate it really is. How far away he really was. Says it was cold during the nights but blistering hot in the day. No protection from the wind during day or night. By the second night a fine layer of sand had already began to cover everything in his car getting in through only a few cracked windows. Brushes it away from the steering wheel and dash. Today he wanted to catch some food and not rely solely on his cache of cashews, jerky, and trail mix. According to topographical maps there's a stream flowing down from the far side of those mountains. Leaves camp proceeds to drive into the desert. Finally get to where the stream is. It's mostly dry but has deeper rocky parts that seem to hold water year round. At the first deep pool he casts into there's cave drawings of ancient battles between gods of tall figures and huge serpents. There's a real sense of piety and sacredness to this place. Catches two Australian bass on lures and a small catfish on a hand line left out. Not much but it will have to do. Head back across the desert kicking up a cloud of sand that quickly dissipates behind him. Four days have passed and no matter how much food or water is drank the feeling of being unsatisfied never leaves, constantly sweating from withdrawals and the heat. No matter how cold or hot it is there isn't a moment of comfort. Days blur into one another when all you do is move from your sleeping bag to your car to pass the time. A weekend and friend is really feeling the effects of everything. 
says no matter no busy he stayed he could not keep his mind off his withdrawals or keep his mind stable anymore. Feels compelled to sit under the tallest tree in his chosen grove while watching the sun rise. Sits in that position all day. Watching the sunset now he realizes that he did a little better today despite getting sunburnt. Is pleased with himself in a weird way. A week and a half into his forced sobriety slash spiritual quest he's reaching a breaking point. No concept of day and night. Just heat and cold, his time is divided between sleeping and sitting under his tree watching nothing diligently. Sees signs of life that he hasn't seen before. During midday he notices groups of birds periodically flying away from the mountains. Not a single kind either, small finches, blackbirds, beautiful songbirds even stately storks and herons make their way over his head out of sight. Night falls with no sounds that day. Even the bugs silence themselves seemingly to witness Kiwi friend's test of will. Tonight he feels more aware of his body and perception. He realizes he is more than sunburnt than he has ever been. How tired and stiff he is. How dirty he is. And how feeble he feels. Nearly two weeks had passed although Kiwi friend wouldn't know until later. His tree and the horizon online surrounding him were all in the world he could see and interact with. Sand had begun to pile around his edges almost like the land was sucking him in. He jokes to himself I must make the worst looking sphinx right now lol. Actually laughs out loud. Realized he can perceive sounds again and how silent it is outside of his own head. Is physically feeling terrible and mentally better than he has in a while. A little big more. A little bit longer. Something's not done yet. He thanks God that it's ending soon. This day was different he awoke late and missed the sunrise. There's clouds in the sky for first time. They resemble a landscape reflected into the sky. Can feel electricity in the air but no rain or lightning. Clouds leave as soon as they arrived. Shadows become long. Feeling of overwhelming sacredness returns. Sitting at attention now as if waiting to be debriefed by God. There's no chill anymore. No heat either. No wind. In that day's final moments the air itself looked clearer like it had be opaque before and was finally scrubbed. As the sun sat on the horizon waiting to go down it seemed to have left a thin piece blacked out. A long thin shadow stretches out from that patch. Kiwi friend becomes aware of his heartbeat for the first time in days. It's over? Is it over? He says to himself out loud. Someone inside him broke down or was finally mended. Stands up on shaky legs. Gets the worst pins and needle sensation ever from standing up so fast. As Kiwi friend is glowing in his triumph the sacred feeling is back stronger than he could have ever imagined. So strong he almost sits down again out of respect. That long shadow is now even longer in the setting sun. Now it's all he can draw his eyes to all he look at. An exceptionally tall figure walking as if the water appeared on the horizon online. Said there was no dread. No fear. No sense of wrongness or that uncanny valley feeling. Only a air of holiness. Thinks he should leave. Starts packing up camping supplies and gear. Kiwi friend realizes not eating and staring at the sun for a few days isn't ideal for evasive maneuvers. Now a feeling of immense shame overcomes him. What is he doing? How can he leave now? What would be the point of it all if he can't see it through to the end? Am I really afraid of withdrawal man now? After everything I'm still afraid? It can't be. Decides to walk to his tree and watch until it's over. Stands at attention and stares directly at it this time. Not a husk reanimated or a spirit nothing outwardly malevolent or benevolent. The horizon looks like it's following it now. Seems to be coming closer but at the same time pulling the ground to it. Remains part of the horizon as it nears. Kiwi friend can make it out better now. A tall man totally wrapped in light furs and loose fabrics. Weird proportions. Elbows in the wrong place. Knees and neck all wrong on an anatomy chart. Carrying a cloth bag and what he described as those hollow gourds dudes have in samurai movies to carry water. 
it somehow feels more intense now raw and open. He begins to cry. He knows he can't watch now something's telling him to go. The weirdest feeling comes over him described as when you feel something could have been but wasn't. Feels like meeting a beautiful girl getting to know each other. Becoming friends for a day then never seeing her again. A feeling of what could have been. So many missed opportunities in the past. So many more missed ones in the future. Endless possible paths you could have taken and will take. Endless paths that will remain unraveled. Kiwi friend is crying now not from sadness but from finality. It feels like he's finished something he likes but because of that can do it no longer. As he drives away mentally broken he sees that. Tall lanky god standing under his tree. All I can hear is water lapping at the sides of our aluminum boat when he finishes. I don't really have anything to say to him. We make small talk on our way back in the morning. Was that god? Be me at 15. 2008. Driving with dad through outback. Driving the plenty slash Donahue highway, between the Stewart highway in the northern territory and Bullia in western Queensland. 700 km unsealed road. See no one but a few trucks, maybe three in total the whole time. Blew two tires about 450 km in and didn't have any more spares so had to drop our speed by a lot just to be safe. As a result end up taking much longer to drive the length of this road than we otherwise would have. For background, there is a myth slash legend in the Bullia area of this so-called Min Min light that harasses and follows travelers and tries to entice them to leave the road at night and follow it out into the desert. We'd traveled in the area plenty of times before and had never seen it, so we weren't really thinking about it. Be about 8.30 pm, pretty dark, night sky out there was amazing BTW, any Australians here I highly recommend. Driving along at about 50 to 60 km per hour to prevent any risk of another tire blowing. Light flashes in front of us like a shooting star, but right in front of the windshield. Dad and I WTF but keep on driving. Happens a few more times. Starts to hang around a bit longer each time. At one point it hovered in front of us for about 30 seconds. Haha ha must be the Min Min, Dad. I'm feeling a little on edge because a light appearing out of nowhere and hovering in front of the car is freaky as fuck. Dad doesn't give a fuck. He starts making verbal challenges to the light. He challenges it to try and lead him off the road. Light disappears. It appears again about 15 minutes later and hovers in front of the car again. Dad stops the car and gets out. The light starts moving off the road and stops about 10 meters off the road and hovers. Dad starts challenging the light again. Is that the best you've got? Picks up a rock and throws it at the light. All the while I'm sitting in the car not knowing whether to shit myself with fear or piss myself laughing at my dad fighting with the light. After a few seconds the light disappears. At this point we're pretty hungry so we stay there for about half an hour or so and make something to eat. Every five minutes dad starts yelling out for the light. Bring it on. I'm waiting. The light never comes back the whole time back. TL. DR my dad had a fight with a paranormal light myth and won. Go hunting by myself. See nothing but small squirrels and other shits that too small for me to waste a bullet on. Fuck this shit, hop in my golf cart ATV and head north, a lot deeper than I usually go and am advised by my dad. Weird shit in those woods anon, be best if you stayed out of them. LOL, that was when I was a kid. I'm not cute enough to molest anymore. Drive up thought the trails, then park off to the side. Walk into the trees, still can't find shit. Wander on for a bit, thinking I might get lucky or at the very least enjoy a nature walk. Soon a pungent smell hits me like a stepfather. Dead animal, there's a kill site nearby. Ready my AR, crouch walk towards the smell. Hear a wet smacking slash crunching sound. Stumble upon an open area and, Jesus Christ. Dead woodland creatures mutilated beyond recognition, tied to trees. Dried blood and entrails pooled and the bottom. 
In the center is some deliverance motherfucker, wearing nothing but long john undies, and boots, covered in blood and stabbing the shit out of a deer carcass. This wasn't harvesting meat, this was just pure mutilation. He's also on top of it while cutting, like he's hugging it. Openly say what the fuck. Before I can't stop myself. His head fucking snaps up like one of those bad skinwalker stories and he starts walking towards me, total deadpan expression. Should AR, shout at him to back the fuck off. Good the bad and the ugly stare down, then I moonwalk away, gun still drawn on him. When I reach a safe distance, GTFO to my ATV. When I do reach it I see him come barreling through the woods holding a homemade spear. No time to turn around, hit reverse for a good 25 yards while he runs down the road at me. With the breathing room try to do a U-turn and get stuck. The stuff off horrormovies.jpg Take out my Glock 20, frantically try to unfuck myself while Jeffrey Dahmer is coming. Get out, he's within 15 feet of me, drive home, never go back there again. Kentucky ladies and gentlemen. Today, I drove my 7 year old son, James, and I into town to go Halloween shopping. I didn't have to buy any candy this year because we live in a cul-de-sac out in the middle of a farming community on the outskirts of the city. I moved there last year because I had divorced my wife and lost my old house along with most custody of James. It's okay, though. James and I love Halloween. It's one of the few times a year that Tracy finds it acceptable for my only son to come visit me. James stays with her on every other holiday through the year, his birthday and everything else in between. I get to see him only on my birthday and the week before Halloween, unless the court finds it suitable for him to come spend the night every once in a while. Frankly, I'm surprised Tracy let him come shopping with me. He showed an extremely strong attraction to a flamboyant green and purple Buzz Lightyear costume. It's really typical for a kid to have an eye for the most expensive thing on the rack, but I didn't have the heart to say no to those profound blue eyes. He also picked out the house decorations. I know we won't be getting any trick or treaters out where I live, but embellishing the exterior of our home was always one of our favorite things to do together. Friday October 21st It looks like James and I will be having some competition for the best Halloween decorations in the neighborhood award, which sadly, in this community, is only fictitious. When I lived with James and my wife, we won the trophy every year since he was three. Now. My next door neighbor is really giving us a run for our money. It looks like he did quite the splurge on decorations, just as we did. He must have ordered everything online, though, because aside from the cliché Happy Halloween banners and the like, some of the festive treasures found on his house and lawn were nowhere to be seen in the store that James and I went to, which sold primarily Halloween-related contraband. The thing that stuck out most to me was the kite string strung from both ends of his garage door that suspended dozens of expensive looking bones and skulls several feet off the ground. He had also placed several other bones sticking upwards, perpendicular with the edge of his lawn. It almost looked rather sinister. There was no color or detail, just random bones placed here and there, strewn about his overgrown and unwatered lawn. I think James and I have beat him, though. Saturday October 22nd. While walking through my house at dusk, I noticed a quick flicker of movement dash in and out of my peripherals outside my dining room window as I was preparing for James' arrival the next day. I can't recall why I chose to inspect was it was, seeing as how I immediately dismissed this movement as a cat or other small animal. I don't even know if I should be glad that I did. I walked back in front of the window about a minute later and saw the same animation, but this time in the center of my vision. I walked back away from the window and slowly peeked out from the corner of the glass. I made out the shape of the very top of a person's head peering over the top of my fence and seemed to be watching me. Whoever it was ducked down again right after they realized that we had made eye contact. I backed away from the window. I don't know why. I crawled over to the family room window, which was about 15 to 20 feet to the left of where I was and facing the same direction as the dining room window. 
I stayed, kneeling timidly but curiously grasping the curtain, I ever so slowly pulled back the cloth, only to reveal the masked fellow who was snooping around behind my property. This time, I saw the entire head. The mask had a gaping, dangling mouth, similar to the mask used in the Scream series. The only difference was that the jaw of the mask was swaying about in the wind and that it also had teeth. A lot of teeth of all different shapes and sizes, surrounding the entire perimeter of the mouth. The expression on the mask was plain, and the tone of color was rather pale, with a sight gray discoloration. It didn't have a goofy smile or an intimidating stare, just a mouth hanging wide open and a couple of perfectly round, beady little chameleon eyes. After about 10 seconds of observation, one of the eyes appeared as if it was steadily drifting off, away from where it was fixated and, very slowly, began to scan to the right, and as soon as the eye seemed to lock onto where I was, he slash she quickly disappeared. What a mask. Tuesday October 25th. I don't really know my neighbor, much less where he gets all of his decorations. I noticed a new ornament of sorts in front of his door today. It was a ceramic bowl full of guts, strategically placed where one would put a bowl of candy if they were too lazy to answer the door for trick or treaters. Behind it was one large white piece of paper bound to the wall of his house with masking tape. On it was written, in nearly illegible chicken scratch, take one. The whole sign had bloody fingerprints smeared all over it. Even more convincing was the bloody tape, and the bloody wall. Nearly the entire wall was smeared in brownish red. Spooky. The blood streams all over the place were even dried. I didn't know they made novelty blood that looked dried like that. I've only ever talked to this neighbor once, and it was around the time that I moved in. He seemed rather distraught. When I approached him, I asked him if everything was alright. He said that he was late for work, which was odd because it was around 8.30 pm. I asked him where he worked and he revealed to me that he was a biologist and worked for the military, but said nothing more. It was strange, every time I saw him after that, his pants had always ridden up his ankles a little bit more. He was always stumbling around awkwardly and constantly tripping over his own feet. My other neighbors and I liked to joke about him from time to time. I remember one specific instance when he was watering his shrubbery and one of his knees gave out. Backwards, like the way a bird's leg works. It looked excruciating to me, but he just walked it off. I've only ever seen him outside again a couple of times after I saw this happen. We stopped making fun of him after that. Last month, as I walked to the mailbox one afternoon, I had heard his kids crying really loudly and frantically. There wasn't any screaming to be heard, just horrible crying. The crying stopped later, which I was thankful for. I was having trouble sleeping through that horrifying racket. It's been several months since I've seen him last. Wednesday October 26th. Ever since James arrived earlier this week, he has simply abhorred the idea of removing his costume. Little Buzz has been running ramp throughout the house quoting Toy Story and Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. He hasn't changed once since he put it on, except for the time I demanded that he allow me to wash I because he was rolling around outside in the dirt, so to speak. I haven't seen any more of this weirdo in the mask lately. It's probably some mischievous kid from the neighborhood behind mine. It's a cul-de-sac too, just a bigger one. There is a dirt road that accompanies an irrigation canal separating the two cul-de-sacs. My house is the farthest house from the main road, and the canal runs parallel to my fence. There's no bridge that I know of that one could use to cross the water, though. Maybe the guy just runs track in school. My neighbor bought a new decoration. Why he's procrastinating so badly, I don't know. It's about 200 feet of lights to accompany the 200 feet of intestines he had previously thrown all over the tree in his front yard. The lights don't coexist with the prior decor, though. All I could smell when I went outside was the burning odor of his literally sizzling ensemble of mix-matched decorations hanging from the tree. When I went outside at night earlier on to go ask him to kindly turn off the lights, 
most of them appeared to be burnt out, so I went back inside. Come to think of it, the smell wasn't so bad. I'd smelled it plenty of times before, I just don't know where. Friday October 28th. I'm going insane. No simple words can properly describe what I believe I have witnessed. Today, I got another glimpse of the masked person. What I saw this time was not at all what I would describe as a mask. I was sitting in my living room reading. The bay window in my living room overlooks the entire street I live on, and I had my blinds open. I had lifted up my head and looked up and out the window at the nearly dissipated sun because I had heard what sounded to me like an asthmatic individual audibly struggling to inhale accompanied by a restless house cat. After a bit of listening to this unnerving sound, I stood up from my couch and walked casually toward the window. I cupped my hands above my eyes to deter the sunlight and pressed my face against the window, and I saw it. It was pursuing a small cat. It ran like an ostrich. Its entire figure was covered in thin hair and big blue veins, its long, matted, nauseating black hair closely following its flaky, decomposing head. Its flapping, jawless chin bobbing happily to and fro, occasionally slapping the sides of its scrawny, pale, indisposed neck. Narrow shoulders rhythmically bounding up and down in harmony with its tree branch-like arms, easily giving it at least a five-foot reach. Mammoth hands were dragging its chopstick fingers, tickling the ground as it ran. Its emaciated, stilt-like legs completed its horrific image. Altogether, I observed an eight and a half foot question mark with greasy hair practically leaping from yard to yard chasing this poor creature for a reason obviously beyond simple sustenance. One could be no less than appreciative that they weren't in the shoes of this poor feline. The cat approached a fence on the left side of the street, followed by its lanky predator. It began to scale the fence. The beast then proceeded to effortlessly jump from the sidewalk, clear the 20 foot lawn, and snatch the animal from the top of the fence with its talon-like claws, as a falcon might. The cat didn't stand a chance, nor did it even manage a voice to squeal. I saw it for a whole three seconds before it disappeared into the shadows with its prize. That amount of time was more than enough to tattoo my retinas with its grotesque image. Saturday October 29th. I now thoroughly believe that the aforementioned beast does, in fact, exist. I've never thought about calling the police, but we all know how they would never find a monster. That is, if they would even respond to such a ridiculous call. I definitely couldn't call in and report a burglar or anything human for that matter, mainly because they wouldn't be looking for what needed to be caught. Earlier tonight, my neighbors threw a street-wide costume party at their place down at the end of the cul-de-sac. I didn't go because I had to work late, and after I picked up James from his friend's house, we anticipated having a game night with the two of us. My reclusive neighbor stayed at bay as well. Sometime during the night, James decided to take a bathroom break. He was gone for over 15 minutes. When he returned, he seemed excited to inform me that he looked out the family room window and saw what he described as a really tall weird looking person with a bag running patiently to the house where the party was being held, empty bag in hand. They would disappear into the backyard of the house and, seconds later, bolt out of the lawn with a full bag and tear off towards my neighbor's house, wearing a costume. They repeated this process several times, each time wearing a different costume than before. He said that on her last round, she stopped in the middle of the street, cocked her head to the right slightly, and her right eye slid to the side of her head and stared right at him as if there weren't a window between them. He said that she then turned her head 180 degrees and locked eye contact with him, and then her colossal mouth sluggishly transformed from a probing expression to the widest smile he thought he'd ever seen. He said that its smile had then hastily collapsed, dropping the chin into a visible free fall which ended with a slinging slap on its chest. It then darted off into a neighbor's yard and that was when he decided to come alert me of his findings. I looked outside the window, but I could see multiple figures, standing around inside the house of the party. I thought of that horrid monster smiling at my beautiful boy. I despised the idea. Next, 
I tried to envision what that particular smile might look like, though I really couldn't. I didn't think a jawless ma that gargantuan had any muscle at all to maneuver that flailing chin in the first place. Lincoln skeleton, so on, so forth. Every one of them was strung up by the back of its neck, feet swinging, head looking down. I really wanted to ask this guy how he comes up with all this and where he gets it all. If he knows that last night's rain washed the color off of most of his little knickknacks. I have to hand it to him, though. The slew of morbid decor in combination with his dirty, rundown, cobweb covered home gives it a true horror movie feel to it. Later that night, I had nearly passed out while finishing up some of my work when my doorbell rang again and again until I reluctantly rose up and walked toward my front door. It was past midnight. I opened the door. It was my neighbor. No, not whatever lived next door, but the fellow who lived behind me on the other side of the canal. He was disgruntled. He was upset and threatening me about something but none of it sank in because one of the skeletons hanging from my neighbor's tree was staring right at me, jaw wide open. It was smaller than the other skeletons around it. A gleam of moonlight revealed that a small string tied through a hole board in the top of its skull was its support. I got goosebumps when I noticed that its eyes were still intact. I then tuned in to the man yelling at me. You listening over there, he asked. Oh. Yeah. The hell you trying to pull? You almost gave my wife a heart attack with that mask. So, apparently, my son and I aren't the only ones who have spotted the neighborhood missing Link. How could he possibly confuse that thing with me? And don't try to smooth talk your way out of this one, pal. I saw you jump clear over that fence of yours, the hell you managed to do that, I'm still wondering, and crawl right back into your basement. I'm terribly sorry. I improvised. I don't know what's come over me. If there's anything I can do dash. My heart sank. I thought about what he said. I don't have a basement. Wait here, I nearly screamed. I sped off into my house. I bolted down the hall. I began to spasm as I neared the guest room door. My trembling hands applied their convulsing energy to the doorknob, then turned and flung the door wide open to reveal my son, sleeping, facing the wall, just as I had left him. He normally doesn't sleep with his head all the way under the blankets, but I was too flustered to notice. I jogged, reassured, back out to my bewildered guest. I didn't know what to think anymore. Sorry, I just dash. He interrupted. Aw, oh, save it. I, for one do not care at all about your problems. You just stay the hell away from me and my family. Yeah here. Yeah, sure. A calming chuckle dug its way into his angry tone right after I noticed the freshly familiar bottomless blue eyes stuffed inside the head of that skeleton. I gotta hand it to ya yeah, though. I nearly died laughing when I saw you running around wearing that little kid's Buzz Lightyear costume. Dad's friend told us about the takeover of a sacred temple in Punjab back in the 80s or so. Sikhs used to have gurus. They don't anymore apparently, the last living one basically said no more gurus will ever come again and then split. But the Sikhs do have a sacred text, I forget the name of it, and people say that it's alive. Like, literally alive. They consider it the last living guru and it sits on a throne like a king, in a temple in Amritsar. The temple is called the Golden Temple or something similar, and obviously it's a sacred place for Sikhs. Anyway, one day this dude comes along. He's an important figure for the Sikhs, a leader of an important sect that is associated with past gurus, so he commands a lot of respect. He starts getting political, demanding an independent state for Sikhs. Now this is in Punjab, so the Indian government is sort of trying to figure out what to do about this guy. Dad's friend is in the army at the time. He hears talk of possibly taking the guy out. But they're not sure if this will make things worse. They decide to sit on their hands and hope the problem goes away by itself. But instead, the Sikh guy takes over the Golden Temple. 
he begins recruiting people for his cause, training them in the temple, basically building a band of insurgents. There are more and more of them every day. Now, India literally can't do anything even if it wants to because if they attack the temple it will piss off every fucking Sikh in the world. To make matters worse, the local Punjabi police is made up of a shitload of Sikhs, and they're all sympathetic to this dude's cause. Other security forces are too. Also, since this temple is where the sacred text lives, nobody wants to desecrate it. So basically the Sikh dude has managed to surround himself with allies and stationed himself within what is basically an impenetrable temple. India's hands are totally tied. But then the guy makes a mistake. He begins assassinating political enemies. There are rumors that he is doing it within the temple itself. He's desecrating a sacred site. And his insurgents have been threatening locals, killing the friends and family of political opponents, etc. This guy was the closest thing to a guru the Sikhs have had in a long time. But he sort of turns into a monster. India decides, fuck it, we have an excuse now, let's go in and get him. Now the official story is that the dude was actually killed in the fray of battle or something. But dad's friend was there and said nobody ever even fired a shot at him. He says that the army charges the temple, taking out tons of insurgents, many of whom just flee. The main dude retreats into the innermost part of the temple. Fuck. The one thing the Indian army told itself before this battle was that it wouldn't go in there, it wouldn't desecrate that part of the temple with a battle. So for a moment everyone's kind of on pause. Then dad's friend decides fuck this and goes in there after the guy. Some of his buddies follow. Some stay behind. The ones that went in there all heard two voices as they entered. But once they were inside they only saw the one guy. Dad's friend gets instant goosebumps and stops dead in his tracks. Everyone else does too. The guy seemed to be pleading with someone but there's nobody there. He approaches the sacred text. Nobody fires a shot. They all feel frozen, like something terrible is about to happen. Sorry didn't realize this would be so long. Also, this is just the way my dad's friends tells the story, so take it with a grain of salt. He's kind of a crazy older man. Something tells dad's friend, shut your eyes, and he does, dad's friend said he wasn't sure if he actually heard this or if it was in his head. Apparently all his buddies shut their eyes too. They hear a terrible sound like someone struggling to scream. Still, nobody fires. Everyone's too freaked out. They feel like if they move they'll die. Nobody even makes a sound. All they hear is someone struggling to scream. This continues for a while and then dad's friend opens his eyes. He and his buddies can all move again. The goosebumps are gone. And the Sikh dude is dead at the foot of the throne with no obvious wounds or injuries. That's it. I liked the way my dad's friend told it, so I decided to share it. His name was Jarnail Singh Bindranwail. He looks like the real deal. Very much so the image of a holy man in India. Almost looks like a Muslim. That might be testament to the crazy mixture of cultures in India, but knowing what he did makes it even more so apparent. Be me. 2019 Find drain tunnel near friend's house. Try to explore, get in maybe 100 feet before it's pitch black. Go to friend's house. Hey bro, wanna come explore this cool drain with me? Sorry Anon, I'm scared by this kind of thing. You can have my headlamp though. Thanks bro, see ya. Return to tunnel. Sun is setting. Head inside, observing surroundings. The deeper into the tunnel the older the graffiti on the walls. Mostly from the 70s and having to do with weed and sex. MFW boomers got high and fucked where I'm standing. Try to ignore that fact and keep moving. Walk for 10 more minutes. Longfuckingtunnel.png Notice walls have been barren for the past 3 minutes. Keep walking. More graffiti comes into view. It looks pretty creepy. 
probably tagged by some edgy kids 30 years ago to scare people. Don't think too much of it. Been walking for 30 minutes now, should probably head back. Walk back. Get to a wall. The wall is blocking what would have been the entrance slash exit. Made of concrete, looks like it's been there for decades. No possible way I could have made a wrong turn, it's all one tube. Trapped in the tunnel. Have to head back down to find a way out. Son of a bitch. JPG. Turn around. Start walking. Walk until the occult symbols again. Hear something behind me. Pick related. Hear multiple appendages slash legs splashing around. Clear, light breathing coming from it. Take picture because I had my phone out trying to get service. It blinks after I take the picture. Lurches forward. Do a 180 and make tracks. Sprint for a good 10 minutes. Muscles dying, lungs burning, throat dry as the Sahara. Eventually see outlet. Sweetfreedom.mov Escape the tunnel. Collapse into a puddle of stagnant water and tadpoles. Walk to friend's house, cold, wet, and tired. Never go back. Be me. In a woods with only like 15 guns and only one set of body armor, it was supposed to be a relaxing hike. Set up my tent, only brought one designed for six people, with only three rooms, because wasn't planning to camp. Here's tongue my anus, I said, unprompted. As is tradition. Niagura's tung anus echoes all around me, as if said by an angry cat being neutered without anesthetic. Based, I say, as the copper smell I definitely have no knowledge of hits me. The Jews are responsible for every war in recorded history, says the creature. That voice though. It's Adolf Hitler. But he died. So I start firing blindly into the trees, which is my right as an American. Uncle Adolf's voice shrieks in the righteous anger only a man persecuted by the synagogue of Satan can truly understand. Check for a body. No sign of the creature, only the families that were at the campground I parked at. None of the women or children look anything like Hitler. Oh god oh fuck. Haven't been able to take amphetamines in the woods except for two or three times since. Really shook me up. I scoured the internet for stories about creatures in the woods that mimic voices and smell like copper but obviously found nothing. Anybody have any idea what it could have been? Sup guys, Russian Anon here to share some spooks. It's not really paranormal but still. Be me. Tenyo. At my best friend's b-day party. Shitloads of kids there and only my friend's mother to look after all of us. Go to McDonald's, used to be almost an elite cuisine in Russia back then, and to the park afterwards. Me and couple of kids playing with some shitty bugs in the bushes. We're approached by a hobo, well, we already knew what it usually meant, so we were ready to bolt the fuck out of there if this fucker would try to kidnap some of us or do something weird. Well, he appeared to be sober and generally a nice guy, claiming that he used to be a biology teacher or SMTH. He looked just like a normal hobo, nothing special, middle-aged ragged guy dressed in some tatty clothes and beanie hat. Can't remember his face, but I'm pretty sure there was nothing scary or disturbing in it. So he told us about some stunning facts about the insects and once my friend's mom appeared to check on us, he just walked away. Well. Could be worse. All of us go back to my friend's place to have a piece of birthday cake. Soon enough my dad picks me up and we walk home, like 10 or 15 minutes of walking from my friend's house, it's already dark outside. We enter our block of flats, it's not that fancy inside, pick related. I am just following my dad, when he stops and I run into his back. Well. I look behind my father and see the same fucking hobo from the park. He just stands there, completely blocking the stairway, looking at us and giggling like an imbecile. Wasn't really scared because my father was right there. Dad used to be a candidate for Soviet Olympic boxing team back in his youth, he's 6'4 250 pounds, aggressive as fuck, 
so he used to beat the shit out of random guys pretty often. Well, my father kindly requested this creep to get the fuck out from our block. No reply from Hobo, he just kept giggling, then reached for his pocket and threw a handful of something at us, it appeared to be fucking teeth, I wanted to pick one of them, but man they were raw, I mean I could see some red tissue on them. Dad's enraged, orders me to stay away, drags this man to the bottom of a stairway and starts mauling him. Strange thing is that the creep could defend himself. And he wasn't even average in terms of physique, he looked small and malnourished, like 5'5 five five at best and skinny. Anyways he couldn't last long being beaten like this, but he didn't get knocked out, what I see as almost impossible. Even when his head collided with the wall, emitting a cool resonating sound, he kept fucking giggling. Even when my dad lifted this fucker and dropped him through the opening, leading to Block's basement, Hobo was still grunting some shit. Laying on his back. Next morning I wanted to cautiously sneak out of our flat to see if this fucker is still in the basement. Saw a pile of fucking teeth gathered right under my entrance door, got scared shitless, locked up. No signs of Hobo though. Like couple of days later I hear screams outside, go to the window to see what's up. It was a woman living in the same block and she was in hysterics, crying and screaming. What goes next is just some rumors compilation, I haven't seen the body or that flat, just overheard my parents slash neighbors convos. A young couple, one of them is that screaming woman, living several floors down came back home from their vacation to find their daughter dismembered and partly cooked in their own kitchen and her grandmother, who was left to look after the girl, missing. So I guess I was lucky getting picked up that day. Even if that's just a crackhead cannibalistic hobo without any paranormal shit in it, I'm still scared when I recall this small fucker overpowering my father several times during that fight. The Grand Caverns Cryptids This photo was taken in 1895 by an amateur spelunker photographer named Oren Jeffries while exploring an unmapped section of Grand Caverns, in southwestern Virginia. At the time it was taken, Jeffries was conducting photographic experiments, using super long exposures to see if anything at all could be captured in the total absence of light otherwise known as cave darkness. He would situate himself on level ground, extinguish his lantern, and then open the lens of his homemade box camera for as long as he could stand the darkness. During one of these experiments, he heard something approach from the deeper recesses of the cave. Frightened, Jeffries abandoned his experiment and set off one of the blitzlicked flashes he used for taking traditional photos underground. According to the report he later gave to a local newspaper, Jeffries saw three humanoid creatures staring at him from the shadows and took off running in the other direction and didn't stop running until he was topside. Several days later, he returned with three other men to retrieve his box camera. This is the image that was recorded on the film inside. So, I used to work in a public library. In the break room in this library, one wall was completely covered with blinds that are always closed. One day, me and all the other teens working there are in this room, because we all took our breaks at the same time, and I get the urge to see some sunlight, so I open the blinds. The windows behind it were pitch black. As if they were painted. It's 3 p.m. in goddamn June, the sun is shining, and the break room shares a wall with the kids' book room, which has windows that see outside no problem. I point this out to everybody and we all realize that no one has ever opened those blinds, despite that more than one person in the room had been there for three plus years. We all get just a little creeped out. Just a little, we work in this building, we're in a big group of people, we've been in this room like a million times before. A girl, we can call her B, suggests that maybe the windows are just painted or something for some reason, and if we open them, we'll see the beautiful day outside. So, this other co-worker of mine, let's call him C, he was the big man in the room, stands up and says, yeah, I'll open it. And he walks right up and does so. And we did not see a beautiful day. We saw an old, old room, that none of us were aware of. It was so dusty, 
I doubt it saw a human touch in 40 years. Like, the whole room was fucking grey it was so dusty. And the room was, get this, filled with toys. There was a big, ladybug shaped sandbox. There was a bicycle. There was a pile of assorted train toys. There was a small stack of thin books, like kids books, that gave me one of those nasty, creepy feelings just looking at it. I was reminded of every creepy child I had ever seen in every movie. And I think everyone else was too, because we all looked at each other, either scared and confused or just scared. And B, she looks in, and looks around in there and says, hey, there's no door in this room. I remember her saying that distinctly. It's like a damn tape recording in my head, because everything so far was just weird, but that sentence is where it got creepy. The break room was separated from this creepy room by a damn wall, with windows in it. Why on earth would anybody wall off a bunch of kids toys, and install windows that looked into the walled off room? It occurs to me at about this time, that the light from the break room makes it really easy to see into the toy room. Like it's not dark in there at all, it is perfectly lit. So why were the goddamned windows pitch black? Shouldn't the light have gone through them, and shouldn't I have been able to see the other room when I moved the blinds? So, I put my hand on one side of an open window, and my head on the other side, and sure enough, I can see through it plain as day. I close the window, and it's pitch fucking black again. I pointed this out to everyone else, and they were completely baffled. About that time, we realized our break was over a few minutes ago, and we went back to the library proper. When we got there, our boss, who was a bit of a hard ass, got mad and asked we were all late. Another co-worker, R, told her we found the weird room behind the windows in the break room. Her response was, oh, that. And she dropped it. This was a woman who would lecture a roomful of people about the littlest goddamn thing, like if somebody left without writing on their senior sheet, never mind our shifts are all predetermined, and she has the master document with all our shifts on it on her desk at all times, that whole building was at DEFCON 1. That woman didn't want to talk about that room. So. Some time later, we're all in the break room again, and someone who wasn't there last time wants to see it. And, I'm still creeped out, but it's one of those creeped outs where you want to expose someone else to it, to make sure that fear is the proper response, and you're not just crazy, so I say sure, and open the blinds, and open an impossibly dark window. And this guy looks around, and he's just having a normal, we found a weird thing reaction. You know, whoa. Why is this here? This is cool. Stuff like that. A minute or two later C opens up another one, and he looks into for a few minutes, and then he turns to me and goes. Hey, this room, I it was dusty as hell last time, right? I say, yeah, because it was, and I see what he's getting at, so I open a window, and look through myself. And the room's been dusted. Like, spick and fucking span. Perfectly clean. Mrs. Brady and Alice had been through this fucking room. Thing is, it was only dusted. Everything was in the same, messy piles it was the last time. Who the hell cleans like that? And I say so. And all the people who were there last time open windows and look through, and have, again, minor freakouts. And C shuts his windows and goes, I think I'm gonna end my break early today and everyone in the room decides that's a good idea, and we shuts our windows, shut the blinds, and leave, all in a silence that no one wants to break. On the way back, we pass a maintenance guy, and B asks him, hey, what's with that walled off room in the break room? And he just stares at us, with this expression on his face that was either shock or fear, but either way, it was strong. And, I guess B thought he was confused, because she says, the one with all the old toys and dash and he cuts her off and says, don't don't go in there, kids. And walks off. I didn't work the next day, but I did the Monday after. 
and C comes up to me that Monday and says, we're not allowed to take all breaks at the same time anymore. And a few days have passed, and I've convinced myself that the toy room was just some kind of crazy set of coincidences, and it doesn't matter, so I'm just responding to the news of a boss taking away an employee privilege. I probably said something like, man, that's lame. I don't even remember what I said, because it's that unimportant. But that same day, me and C, and two other people are slacking off in one of the aisles, and we've been talking about this change all day, so I say, hey, why did you guys all start taking your breaks at the same time in the first place? And C says, because, and here he gets visibly afraid, because we always felt creeped out in the break room alone. Like we were being watched. That break room saw little to no use while I was at that job after that happened. When we took our breaks after that, we just lounged around this big couch in the reading area, and it was way more comfortable than the folding chairs in the break room anyway. We sometimes all took our couch breaks at the same time anyway, and no one gave us crap over it, so I'm pretty sure the rule was just an attempt to keep us out of that room. Like, we couldn't legally be denied breaks, and boarding it up or something would have been too extreme, but they didn't want us screwing around in that room, and assumed we only had the courage to do so in a big group. Does anybody have any fucking explanation for that room? Cause I don't. When I was younger, I had the misfortune of knowing someone who I believe to this day is an actual and complete fucking psychopath. I'll just call him Frank. I met Frank in an after school daycare in second grade and we were insta friends. He was actually the only friend I ever had there, the owner was a shithead who encouraged kids to bully each other for entertainment, she's in jail now, so no other friends were made. Three months later, in the summer between second and third grade, we had a field trip to the local pool and Frank and I were just doing our thing. Then he stops talking mid-sentence and stares out into to open. We were having a pretty mundane conversation too, I don't even remember what it was. A flash of rage crosses his face, subsiding to a calculating expression of premeditated violence. Fucking scary Tiff. Another flash of rage, and he punches me in the face. We were in the deep end, and I little me was pretty weak. He presses his thumbs into my larynx and holds me underwater. I remember holding my breath, kicking him, trying to move his arms away, and worse yet, I remember seeing his face through the ripples. I feel like he was just gazing down at me, blankly. His expression was so neutral that it must have looked like nothing was happening. 35 seconds. I couldn't hold it anymore. Then I remember more splashing, frantic, feet and fists flying around me. An older girl dragged me out of the water at the last second while another boy my age wrestled Frank off of me. Frank fought back, and the other boy broke his nose. But the way it happened, it almost seemed like he was just letting it happen. Then he went crying to the lifeguards and the owner, bawling his eyes out. I saw pain, fear, regret, shame, all on his face, pushing tears out with their enormous weight. Or so I thought for maybe a second. For just a moment, not even four seconds, there was no one looking at Frank. The lifeguards were seeing if I was okay, any parents present had tuned the situation out almost immediately, the girl was off to the side defending her brother's actions, and the daycare lady had turned around to yell at him instead of consoling what she also thought were some genuine emotions on Frank's part. Literally the second no one was seeing what he was doing, Frank's head was pointed at me. It was so frighteningly instantaneous, that I was looking right at him and didn't see his head move. It was there, and then it was there, no apparent motion in between. He was blank again, no emotions, no sobs, tears drying on his face. That look slowly turned back into that expression of calculation. Brows raised. Chin up. Sides of his mouth tense. The face of premeditated violence. I was so scared, I started crying. And then, as the daycare lady began turning back towards him, 
before they should even have been able to see each other, he looked up at her and resumed his sobbing. Everyone believed his side of the story, that I had dared him to hold me under to scare the lifeguards. No one believed me, or the older girl, or the other boy. No one. It's been over ten years, and there is still no one on this earth that I fear more than Frank, and nothing I remember more clearly than that day. And the worst part is. I have more Frank stories, if anyone wants to hear them. That was just the first. Grade 4 was the next time I met Frank. He was in my class. I begged and begged the principal and the counselors and just about anyone who would listen to put me in a different class. Whenever I saw Frank, he was staring at my friend, who we shall call Jane. Every time she caught him staring, he didn't quickly look away like any other fourth grade boy who was just discovering eh, dames ain't so bad, ya yeah knows. If anything, I think this was his version of a first crush. But he would never avert his gaze. No matter how many times she caught him, he would just keep staring. He would never stop until a few minutes after she would try to make him stop. I remember during recess one day, he walked up to her and I and asked to speak to her alone. Some of her bratty little girlfriends heard this and made their usual oh oh, a descendant and yet polar opposite of you boys have cooties, so she felt pressure to go and talk to him. Jane's friends walked away, and I just stood there, watching them. Frank whispered something in Jane's ear, and she looked terrified. She stood there, tears in her eyes and total shock on her face. Frank stepped towards her, pushing his chest out and looking angrily down his nose at her. Her feet were glued to the ground, and she was just staring back at him, seemingly afraid to break eye contact, sobbing quietly and looking terrified. I couldn't move either, I was too shocked by what I saw to step in. After a full 30 seconds of this, he smiled and bade her a polite but bye. He walked away and she ran towards me, burying her face into my shoulder and sobbing, first time I ever touched a girl with repulsing in horror, btw, cuz you know, elementary school. She wouldn't tell me what he said. She didn't speak to any other students for the next five days. Then, she was moved to a different school, and my wish to change classes was abruptly granted. I had no Frank to worry about. I still saw Frank around the school and whatnot, but it was years before he paid me any attention again. He had plenty of friends by fifth grade, and he was smiley and nice and acting normal, and so at the time I thought he was fine. Jane on the other hand, I was always suspicious, always worried about what had become of her. The next time I saw Jane was a full seven years later, in eleventh grade. She didn't look anorexic or anything, but she was so small and delicate. I talked to her for a few hours, and we caught up with each other on everything that happened since then. Mostly she had a nervous frown on her face, avoiding eye contact and speaking softly. She looked down, stroking her hand across her opposite shoulder whenever she spoke. A couple times, I put my hand on her shoulder or I said just the right thing, and she'd smile and chuckle a little bit. There was a lot of small talk, but we also told each other where we had been since grade 4. I stayed in the same town, same school system the entire time. She always missed her friends here, and the day that Frank died, she and her parents started making plans to return. She had taken the rest of grade 4 off, and it took months for her therapist to get her to repeat Frank's words. She still won't tell me what he said, that was the only time she ever repeated it. She was homeschooled in grade 5 and 6, on the other end of the province, and, and after that she went to a normal school and had some normal times. To this day, she is incredibly timid, except for a few moments we've had, but still very happy and stable. The only lapses in her mental stability seem to be when someone mentioned Frank, psychopaths in general, or worryingly enough, rape. Then she gets paranoid, and stays that way for a few days. Not even Frank's violent demise stopped her from having one more encounter with him, but if I say more, I'm gonna tell the stories in order, so that comes later. More Frank? 
In grades 5 and 6, I didn't pay much attention to Frank. Everything I remember him doing in that period was pretty normal. He went everywhere on a bicycle, had his first girlfriend, I think he was on a soccer team or something. I didn't talk to him, but he had plenty of friends and seemed well adjusted. Maybe he just had little boy problems. I think we all remember two or three little boys with anger problems when they're little, that kinda just go away eventually. I totally thought that was the case with Frank. Then, enter grade 7. Frank was in my class again that year, and he kinda started to freak people out after a while. Every 7th grader wished to be a badass, but Frank would never shut up about knives and guns and porn. Everyone, including his friends and even teachers, started getting really scared of him again. Being fairly nice for a 12-year-old, I figured he just needed someone to spend time with, so I volunteered some afternoons and we hung out a few times a month. He had a much better home life than I would have thought. His dad died when he was little, but his mom was a lovely lady. After being a guest in her house, I could understand why your mom jokes made Frank so angry. Things were good. Frank started seeming really well adjusted again in around January, and we had a bit of a group of friends going. Things were good. Then Frank started showing me things. He owned dozens of knives, hunting, and combat and utility, all sorts, his mother didn't know about them. He started bringing them to school with him. I think I was the only person who knew. He would show only me, during lunch every day. He'd pull a different little one out of his pocket and say just in case. I thought he was paranoid about other people. In March, tensions built between Frank and another boy, who we shall call Douche Canoe. I don't even remember what they were fighting about, it was whatever pisses off 13-year-old boys, I guess. I saw Frank giving Douche Canoe that blank stare. That one I had forgotten. That one I had feared. It was during class. Douche Canoe noticed, and told Frank to stop. Frank didn't even blink. He sat and kept staring, just like he had done to Jane. Knowing that a fight was coming, and I've never been much of a fighter myself, I did the only thing I could do to help Douche Canoe. At the beginning of lunch break, when the fight was soon to go down, I picked Frank's pocket and threw his knife down a storm drain. Frank stared Douche Canoe down. Douche Canoe was terrified. Frank once again had the face of premeditated violence. I remember his shoulders looking broad and square under his old leather coat. Frank marched towards Douche Canoe, with the same I gonna rape you body language he used on Jane. Douche Canoe panicked and swung first. Frank moved so fast, it was like Douche Canoe's arm snapped itself. Frank drove his foot into Douche Canoe's jaw and tackled him to the ground. He reached for his pocket and found nothing. I'm glad I took the knife. I remember Frank's blank face throughout the whole thing. He looked bored as he pounded Douche Canoe's head into the dirt. The chanting and cheering stopped, and everyone just watched in silent horror. Frank's alternated arms with his punches, and each was exactly one second after the last. But each individual punch was frightening. He would raise a fist up behind his head and drive into Douche Canoe's face in an imperceptible fraction of a second. I sure hope the teachers were doing something real fucking important that kept them from intervening a whole three minutes. The kids who had gathered, including myself, were crying in empathy and fear for Douche Canoe as Frank stood up, faced the teacher and said without blinking, smiling, frowning, or even the slightest movement of his eyebrows, call this boy an ambulance. Frank got a 10-day suspension. Douche Canoe got two months in the hospital. The scariest thing about Frank's demise is that it wasn't the last time Jane or I ever saw him. There's always a group of boys who do this in 8th grade, start a gang. Walking around their suburban town with untouched knives in their pockets, running around and hiding like criminals when their only crime is occasional loitering. Every 8th grader wants to be a badass. The difference with Frank is that while his friends grew out of it, Frank grew into it. Grade 10 is when high school starts in my province, 
and while it's a great school and a super fun time, it exposes you to the fact that even the quaintest little burbs aren't completely innocent. In fact, being as close to the mountains as we were made our town into quite the cutesy little drug highway. Frank became a drug dealer. The rumor to this day is that Frank never took any narcotics, not even once. The guy was fucking crazy on his own. I wasn't the best high schooler either, so I was with a client of his during a trade once. Frank did it the whole time, the stare. Maybe he was doing it on purpose, using his reputation to intimidate. Maybe he was just doing it. I don't know. There was even a rumor going around that he raped a girl. The last year of Frank's life was fairly shrouded in rumors, but there were a few that I didn't believe. This was one I didn't need to believe, because he told me himself. I saw Frank the night before he died. It was the first time I had ever seen him afraid. We bumped into each other near a Tim Hortons, and had a coffee and talked for a while. He didn't understand what he had done to people. He didn't understand why everyone was freaking out about the rumor that he raped someone. We talked about her, and Jane and Douche Canoe and countless other people he had wronged. He just didn't get it. He called them cattle, sheep, human livestock. He didn't care, and he didn't understand why anyone else would. It's not like they're fucking important anyway. I tried to get up and leave. He put a firm hand on my shoulder and pulled me back onto my chair. Suddenly, and for the first time that I know, he looked afraid. Vulnerable, even. He explained to me that his boss lived in the nearby city, and was a scary, powerful gangster. For reasons I don't know to this day, Frank and his boss had a falling out. The look trickled onto Frank's face. Eyebrows raised. Chin up. Sides of the mouth tensed. The face of malevolence. I had just gotten my driver's license, and Frank asked me to drive him into the city. Ordered me. I was afraid to say no. We didn't talk on the way there. The last time I ever saw Frank, he was pulling a pistol out of his coat. He told me to pull over. He got out and walked away. I drove away as quickly as I could. He muse have stayed somewhere overnight. The next day, there was a news report of a gunfight, but no known fatalities. A few days later, Frank's stepdad reported him missing. After a week of uncertainty, a body matching Frank's description was pulled out of a dumpster by a police officer, rotting and riddling with bullet holes and shrapnel. The scariest part? I lied when I said that was the last time I ever saw Frank. No. I'll tell you the end. I don't know if the mainstream media bothered with this, but the local news went crazy for weeks. The bodies of all sorts of gangsters started showing up dead out of nowhere. A body matching Frank's description had been found, but it was mutilated. Very few people know that he is in fact, alive today, and Frank isn't his real name, so don't bother. My theory is that he spent that first day picking off his aggressors one by one finishing by pitting the last few against some poor schmook about the same height, weight, and hair color. But really, that's all conjecture on my part. I don't know how he did it. It's not like he'd just have a twin lying around at his disposal. A year after graduating high school, Jane and I were at my apartment, catching up. I had cleaned up my act a lot since grade 10, and Jane had a fairly spotless act to begin with. She was so relaxed that day. The air of nervousness, the tension she carried around, was absent that day. She was as quiet as ever, I supposed she just has a small voice, but she wasn't timid. My buzzer went off. I can't explain how or why I felt so uneasy. I opened the door, Jane close on my heels, to see Frank turning to walk down the staircase. We saw him, but he didn't see us. I don't think he knows we know he's alive. Jane was silent with terror. I was shocked and angry, but I let that go when I knew she needed some calming down. I don't know if it was a sick fucking joke or something, but if you read the first Frank story on this thread, this will almost disgust you. 
he left only two things on my doormat. A pair of water wings and a snorkel. I was hiking in the woods the other day and for the first time ever it sounded like all sound just completely stopped. The birds went silent. The wind, which was normally loud, the oceans not too far away, stopped. I couldn't hear the waves crashing on the coastline, I didn't hear any forest ambience like leaves falling. No twigs snapping. I could just hear my own footsteps and so I stopped just to take it all in. I can understand perfect quietness when you're indoors in an enclosed space, but in the forest? That just felt impossible to me. And weirdest of all I started to feel uneasy because I felt truly alone in the forest for the first time ever. I didn't feel like anything was watching me or anything was nearby me. That's what scared me. Usually I can hear and thus have a good idea of where all of the birds, squirrels, and random critters are, and the occasional snapping of twigs in the woods never puts me on guard because I know it's just an animal and it comforts me that I'm not alone. But in that moment, I felt like I was just truly alone in the woods and the only living things in the vicinity were me and the trees. Probably the most anxious and unnerved I've ever felt in my life. Like you're not in danger but you feel like you shouldn't be there, like I could disappear like seemingly everything else in that area. That was actually a real fear in my mind. I don't know how unfounded it was, but I have a morbid fascination with people going missing in the woods and the conspiracy theories and paranormal theories linked to that stuff. I felt like in that moment, something was going to happen to me. I would be the next missing person never to be found. And so I just kept walking, I wasn't lost or anything and knew my way back, and after what could have been 5 minutes to 30 minutes of just the sound of me walking and moving, the natural sounds of the woods and critters and stuff just kind of came back suddenly. I still don't know if I was actually in danger. 